and welcome to 4-H STEM Summer Reading Connections. My name is Jen and I am your host. I'm a 4-H educator in Garfield Loop in Wheeler Counties and I'm coming to you from Burwell, Nebraska. If you're new to summer reading, we take the annual theme, which this year happens to be Imagine Your Story, and we pair it with 4-H curriculum. Since we love STEM and 4-H, we decided to take a myth busters approach. And this year, we're taking some myths and busting them using our knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. So today, we're gonna to be busting some myths about weather in our lesson called, The Truth About Weather. Now we're gonna need a few supplies for today's lesson. And I have a list here for you to check out. The first supply you're going to need is shaving cream. Now this needs to be the foam kind and not the gel kind. And you may be able to substitute hair mousse in a pinch. You'll need two jars or potentially one jar and a clear plastic cup if you don't happen to have two jars. You'll need water, food coloring, a tray for catching water drips, a sponge, and you're gonna need a squirt bottle or a squeeze bottle. Now take a moment, pause the screen, and see if you can find the supplies that you need. When you're ready, plus press play, and we'll be ready for you to come back and join us for the pledge. In 4-H events, we like to open with the 4-H pledge. This kind of tells you about the values that we hold in 4-H. If you happen to be a 4-H member and know the pledge, feel free to stand up and do the actions. If you don't know the pledge, I've put it on the screen for you and you can follow along with me. I pledge my head to clearer thinking, my heart to greater loyalty, my hands to larger service, and my health to better living for my club, my community, my country, and my world. Thank you for joining me in the pledge. Today's story will be read by Sonia Gloop. Sonia is an extension assistant in Boone and Nance counties, and she's coming to us from Fullerton, Nebraska. Today, she's going to be reading Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs by Judy Barrett. I hope you listen closely to see if you can learn any clues about weather that might help us in busting some myths about them later. Cloudy with a Chance of Meatballs. Written by Judy Barrett and drawn by Ron Barrett. We were all sitting around the big kitchen table. It was Saturday morning, pancake morning. Mom was squeezing oranges for juice. Henry and I were betting on how many pancakes we could each eat, and Grandpa was doing the flipping. Seconds later, something flew into the air and headed towards the kitchen ceiling and landed right on Henry. After we realized that the flying object was only a pancake, we all laughed, even Grandpa. Breakfast continued quite uneventfully. All the other pancakes landed in the pan, and all of them were eaten, even the one that landed on Henry. That night, touched off by the pancake incident at breakfast, Grandpa told us the best tall tale bedtime story he'd ever told. Across an ocean, over lots of huge bumpy mountains, across three hot deserts, and one smaller ocean. There lay the tiny town of Chew and Swallow. In most ways, it was very much like any other tiny town. It had a main street lined with stores, houses with trees and gardens around them, a schoolhouse, about 300 people, and some assorted cats and dogs. But there were no food stores in town of Chew and Swallow. They didn't need any. The sky supplied all the food they could possibly want. The only thing that was really different about Chew and Swallow was its weather. It came three times a day at breakfast, lunch, and dinner. Everything that everyone ate came from the sky. Whatever the weather served, that was what they ate. But it never rained rain, it never snowed snow, and it never blew just wind. It rained things like soup and juice, it snowed mashed potatoes and green peas, and sometimes the wind blew in storms of hamburgers. 
The people could watch the weather report on television in the morning, and they would even hear a prediction for the next day's food. When the townspeople went outside, they carried their plates, cups, glasses, forks, spoons, knives, and napkins with them. That way, they would always be prepared for any kind of weather. If there were leftovers, and there usually were, the people took them home and put them in their refrigerators in case they got hungry in between meals. The menu varied. By the time they woke up in the morning, breakfast was coming down. After a brief shower of orange juice, low clouds of sunny side up eggs moved in, followed by pieces of toast. Butter and jelly sprinkled down for the toast, and most of the time it rained milk afterwards. For lunch one day, Frankfurters, already in their rolls, blew in from the northwest at about five miles an hour. There were mustard clouds nearby. Then the wind shifted to the east and brought in baked beans. A drizzle of soda finished off the meal. Dinner one night consisted of lamb chops, becoming heavy at times with occasional ketchup, Periods of peas and baked potatoes were followed by gradual clearing, with a wonderful jello setting in the west. The sanitation department of Chew and Swallow had a rather unusual job for a sanitation department. It had to remove the food that fell on the houses and sidewalks and lawns. The workers cleaned up things after every meal and fed all the dogs and cats. Then they emptied some of it into the surrounding oceans for the fish and turtles and whales to eat. The rest of the food was put back into the earth so that the soil would be richer for people's flower gardens. Life for the townspeople was delicious until the weather took a turn for the worse. One day there was nothing but gorgonzola cheese all day long. The next day there was only broccoli, all overcooked. And the next day there were Brussels sprouts and peanut butter with mayonnaise. Another day there was a pea soup fog. No one could see where they were going and they could barely find the rest of the meal that got stuck in the fog. The food was getting larger and larger and so were the portions. The people were getting frightened. Violent storms blew up frequently. Awful things were happening. One Tuesday, there was a hurricane of bread and rolls all day long and into the night. There were soft rolls and hard rolls, some with seeds and some without. There was white bread and rye and whole wheat toast. Most of it was larger than they had ever seen bread and rolls before. It was a terrible day. Everyone had to stay indoors. Roofs were damaged and the sanitation department was beside itself. The mess took the workers four days to clean up and the sea was full of floating rolls. To help out, the people piled up as much bread as they could in their backyards. The birds picked at it a bit, but it just stayed there and got staler and staler. There was a storm of pancakes one morning and a downpour of maple syrup that nearly flooded the town. A huge pancake covered the school. No one could get it off because of its weight, so they had to close the school. Lunch one day brought 15 inch drifts of cream cheese and jelly sandwiches. Everyone ate themselves sick and the day ended with a stomach ache. There was an awful salt and pepper wind accompanied by even worse tomato tornado. People were sneezing themselves silly and running to avoid the tomatoes. The town was a mess. There were seeds and pulp everywhere. The sanitation department gave up. The job was too big. Everyone feared for their lives. They couldn't go outside most of the time. Many houses had been badly damaged by giant meatballs. Stores were boarded up and there were no more school for the children. So a decision was made to abandon the town of Chew and Swallow. 
It was a matter of survival. The people glued together the giant pieces of stale bread sandwich style with peanut butter, took the absolute necessities with them and set sail on their rafts for a new land. After being afloat for a week, they finally reached a small coastal town which welcomed them. The bread had held up surprisingly well, well enough for them to build temporary houses for themselves out of it. The children began school again and the adults all tried to find places for themselves in the new land. The biggest change they had to make was getting used to buying food at a supermarket. They found it odd that the food was kept on shelves packaged in boxes, cans, and bottles. Meat that had to be cooked was kept in large refrigerators. Nothing came down from the sky except rain and snow. The clouds above their heads were not made of fried eggs. No one ever got hit by a hamburger again. And nobody dared to go back to Chew and Swallow to find out what had happened to it. They were too afraid. Henry and I were awake until the very end of Grandpa's story. I remember his good night kiss. The next morning, we woke up to see snow falling outside our window. We ran downstairs for breakfast and ate it a little faster than usual so we could go sledding with Grandpa. It's funny, but even as we were sliding down the hill, we thought we saw a giant pad of butter at the top and we could almost smell mashed potatoes. The end. Thank you so much, Sonia, for reading our story. I hope you picked up some new tips about weather and maybe some ideas of some of the myths that we might bust with Jennifer. So our presenter today is Jennifer Hansen. She's a 4-H youth development educator in Thurston County coming to us from Penner, Nebraska. Jennifer is going to help us bust some commonly held weather myths, and I'm sure you've heard them from your family members. Thanks, Jennifer, and take it away. Hi, Jen. How are you today? I'm good. How are you, Jennifer? I'm great. What's the weather like in Burwell? It is a beautiful day and the sun is shining here. How about you? Exactly. The sun's shining, although we do have some big poofy clouds outside. Do you know what that type of cloud is called? You know, I don't know my clouds, but it seems like there are a lot of different kinds. There are a lot of different kinds of clouds. Jen, do you know any stories about clouds? You know, actually, I did hear in a Native American lore. So the Skinny Pawnee have a story that there is um, a sky god who wears cloud garments, and when he spreads his arms, the clouds or garments stretch across the entire sky. Isn't that interesting? That is really interesting. So that makes me think, I wonder what all the names of these clouds are. Let's go learn about the different types of clouds. I loved learning about Jen's myth, especially since it has ties to Nebraska. So in the truth about weather, clues in the sky, we're gonna learn how to read the sky for clues about what the weather might do. The clues that we have in the sky, those are clouds. And as you can see, there's a large variety of clouds and they all sit at different spots in the atmosphere. The atmosphere is just a fancy word for air. Let's look at our first cloud type now. Cirrostratus clouds, those are the sheet-like ones that cover the sky. They usually appear 12 to 24 hours before it rains. While they cover the sky, the sun can still be shown through them. Cirrocumulus clouds, these appear as small puffs in a long row covering the sky, almost like the scales of a fish. They're usually seen in the winter and indicate fair weather, but very cold weather. Altostratus clouds, these are mid-level clouds that are six to 5,000, 6,500 to 18,000 feet in the air. These clouds are gray or blue-gray and are made up of ice crystals and water droplets. They fill the whole sky and usually form just ahead of continuous rain or snowfall. Also cumulus clouds, these are the gray puffy masses made up of water droplets. They form in groups, and when you see them in the mornings during the summertime, you should be preparing for thunderstorms in the afternoon or evening. I'm definitely gonna need to pay more attention to the sky now. Stratus clouds, 
These cover the sky like fog that doesn't reach the ground. They're gray and produce a light drizzle or a mist. I'm pretty sure this is the kind of clouds we had around here yesterday. Stratocumulus clouds. These clouds are low, puffy, and gray, and they form in rows with the blue sky showing through, and they rarely produce any rain. Nimbostratus clouds. These are wet looking and dark gray. They form a layer that produces steady falling rain. Cumulus clouds are by far my favorite type of cloud because they look like cotton candy and they indicate fair weather. These clouds can eventually tower upwards to form cumulonimbulus clouds. That's kind of a tongue twister. A cumulo cumulonimbulus cloud are what we call thunderstorm clouds or thunderheads. The high winds flatten the top of these clouds and then these clouds produce heavy rain, hail, thunder, and lightning. And they can even develop into tornadoes. Now that we know about the different types of clouds, I wonder what we're gonna learn next. Well, now that I know what the different types of clouds are called, we're gonna make our own cloud today here in our houses. So for this activity, you will need a clear container glass jar, plastic cup, whatever you have on hand, water, of course, foam shaving cream, and food coloring. So the first step for this activity is to go ahead and fill your container almost to the top full of water. I do recommend that you keep some type of tray or container underneath your, your jar or cup so that if you spill, the water doesn't run all over the place. Next, you're going to take your shaving cream and give it a good shake. And then you're going to make your own rain cloud in the middle of your container. Sometimes you have to push that button really hard. There you go. We'll get it filled up here. Use your thumb, that might work a little bit better. Let's provide some technical assistance. You may need an adult to help you with this. There we go. Does that look like a good cloud? It looks like, you know the big, tall rain clouds? Yeah. Next, you are going to take your food coloring and drip it on your cloud. And then hopefully, your cloud will start to rain into your jar. So just add some food coloring. You can add more than one color. We can also learn about what happens when we mix colors. So that's yellow, although it looks kind of orange right now. And what color are we gonna mix with it? Blue. And what color did blue and yellow make? Green. Very good. We don't quite see any rain happening yet, so maybe add some more food coloring. Now we're gonna add some red, it looks like. Oh, that's pretty. And you'll start to notice that your cloud is now raining into your jar. Yeah. The yellow looks like some lightning, like it's really bad. Yeah. Wasn't that a fun activity, Jen? That was so much fun. I think it's cool to see those clouds and then to see the stuff fall out of them. Do you know what shape a raindrop is? You know, I always thought it looked like a teardrop. Is that true? It's not, surprisingly, because I thought the same thing. The smallest raindrops are spherically or circle-shaped. But as a raindrop grows and gets bigger, when it falls out of the sky, the drag force increases and it flattens the bottom of that raindrop, turning it into a shape that's more like a hamburger patty. That makes me think of hamburgers falling from the sky. That would just be crazy. I know. Just think we'd go outside, pick it up off the sidewalk, and eat it. Kind of like in our story today. So now we're going to make it rain inside. And for this activity, we're going to need a jar or clear plastic cup again, sponge, squirt, squeeze bottles, or a pitcher, something to pour water out of, water, and food coloring. And don't forget, food coloring can be kind of messy. We've now made our own cloud and even got to see some rain fall out of our cloud. For this next activity, it has two parts. The first part is 
we're going to talk about how clouds or sponges for this example absorb water. This is a sponge. Sponges are what we call porous, meaning they have little holes in them. What do you think is going to happen when your sponge gets full of water? Let's find out. Okay, so what you're going to do is you're going to over an empty bowl, you're going to pour water into your sponge slowly in the middle of the sponge. And you'll notice he's pouring water, but none of it's dripping it. Oh, stop. Now it's starting to drip because that sponge has become saturated or full of water. Go ahead and give it a good squeeze and get it rinsed out. For the second part of this activity, you are going to need a sponge, a clear container, in this case we're using a glass jar, and then water. We did add some food coloring to our water so that when it rains we'll be easily able to see it rain inside our jar. What you are going to do is very carefully you are going to pour the water over your sponge. Now if you had a squirt bottle or a squeeze bottle you could definitely use that. We don't have that today so we're using this measuring cup. Oh stop. Notice it is starting to rain inside the jar. Why don't you go ahead and add a little bit more water to the sponge so we can see that once our cloud becomes saturated and full of water, those water droplets have gotten too heavy for our cloud to hold, they fall out to the ground as precipitation. So we made it rain. We've talked about clouds. You know what that makes me think of, Jen? What's that? Thunderstorms. Oh yeah. Do you like thunderstorms? You know, I was pretty scared of them when I was a kid, but now I like to watch them. They're pretty exciting. So in a thunderstorm, we have clouds and we have rain and we have thunder. And what are we, what's, what's that bright, shiny thing? Lightning? Yeah, lightning. That's the other, and sometimes there's wind too, right? Mm-hmm. So I always heard that lightning never strikes anything twice. Is that true, Jen? Do you know? You know, actually, that's not true. So the Empire State Building gets struck on average 100 times a year. And that's because tall, isolated objects have a strong enough electrical field around them to be struck repeatedly. There's even a guy named Roy Sullivan who's been struck seven times as a park ranger. I think Roy better stay inside the next time it's supposed to have be a thunderstorm. I think so, too. So that makes me think. You've got thunder and lightning and rain and clouds and wind. How do you think that happens up there in the sky? You know, I don't know, but it must be pretty intense. I thought so too, and then I was researching it, and really, it just involves convection currents. What's a convection current? Well, a convection current is basically unstable air. What happens is a warm body of air is forced to rise up because of the approaching cold front. And as that cold front pushes it up, it has a persistent updraft of warm, moist air. And then that approaching cold front helps to build the updraft into a cumulus cloud, which we learned about earlier. Remember, those cumulus clouds are the cotton candy looking ones. But what happens is that updraft causes those clouds to turn into cumulonimulus clouds or thunderheads those of us that don't know the fancy words, right? And what those cumulonimbulus clouds look like, that's kind of a tongue twister one, I think. Um, the high, they have the flat top on them because the high winds flatten the top of them and they can produce the heavy rain, the hail, the thunder, the lightning, and maybe even develop into tornadoes. So I have a demonstration that I'm gonna show you that demonstrates how a convection current happens in the sky. You can do this activity at home, and what you'll need to do is you'll need to make ice cubes that are blue. So you'll have to add blue food coloring to your ice, to your water before you freeze it to make it into ice. Now we're gonna demonstrate how a convection current works. For this activity, you're going to need a clear container filled about halfway full with water. You're going to need to make yourself some ice cubes that have blue food coloring or another color of food coloring in them. And then you're going to need red food coloring or another color of food coloring. 
So we filled our container halfway full with water and I'm very carefully without bumping my table or disturbing the water too much going to place some ice cubes with the blue food coloring off to the side. On the other side, my helper is going to drop two or three drops of red food coloring and then we are going to observe what happens with a convection current. Whoa! So the food coloring starts to spread, but you're going to notice the red food coloring is going to want to come to the top as the blue food coloring sinks to the bottom because the red food coloring represents the warm air and the blue food coloring represents the cold air mass that is pushing that red air mass to the top. Can you see how that's kind of happening in there? Yeah, and I noticed when it was going down when the red food coloring, it stayed in a circle and it didn't a sphere and it when it hit the ground, it didn't hit the bottom of the thing, it just hit. It didn't spread out as much. And as you can see, the red food coloring is floating on top of our water. Jen, what did you think of that demonstration? That was so interesting. So much fun to watch how that works. And now I kind of get how a thunderstorm can form. Hopefully we all learned a lot today about clouds and rain and convection currents. I hope you enjoyed doing these activities with me. Thank you, Jennifer, for teaching us how to bust some weather myths. Those activities were so fun. Now, if you enjoyed this, be sure to teach your family the activities that you learned today so that they can bust some myths and have a better severe weather season for knowing exactly what's happening behind the scenes in those thunderstorms. If you enjoyed today's lesson, I also want you to consider joining us for more summer reading fun. We have other sessions on spiders, myth or fact, germs, germs everywhere, and bust your breakfast. And each time we'll be doing a story, some great science activities, and we'll be busting some myths using our STEM knowledge. You can find all of these resources at our website at this link below. And if you pause the video right now, you can copy paste that link into your browser to find those resources. I also wanna make sure that I mention that Nebraska 4-H has lots of great virtual resources that they're adding weekly this summer. Some things including fair workshops, STEM, if you like today's STEM lesson, and other things like entrepreneurship, photography, and more. So be sure to check those out at 4h.unl.edu. If you enjoyed today's story, we have other great titles to recommend, including I Survived the Children's Blizzard of 1888, Weather, Thunderstorm, and Pickles to Pittsburgh, which happens to be by the same author and a sequel to today's story. You can find these great titles at your local library, and if not, be sure to ask them if they can track those titles down for you. Thank you for joining the 2024-H STEM Summer Reading Connections. On behalf of the team, I am your host, Jen, and I hope you'll join us again for another session. Thanks, and bye.